Um, hey, if you've got a collection of ancient documents there that we call a Bible, um, that's good. Um, hey, you know what I did find out this week very quickly before I, I share what I want to share? Did you know that they've done studies and they found out that ants cannot get COVID? Now, I, I, see, you wouldn't think, who would study that? But yeah, apparently ants can't get COVID because they've got antibodies. Please, that's just the free version. You want more? You've got to sign up. Um, hey, I want to talk this morning. We've been talking about faith. That was good, by the way, that joke. Um, I want, we, we've been talking about faith for a number of weeks now. Just to give you a bit of a heads up, we've probably got about three more weeks uh, on faith that we're going to be talking on. Um, next week, we have um, Bruce. He's going to be preaching. Yep, there we go. We've got a fan club already started. We've got Bruce preaching next week on um, faith and presumption. Um, then we uh, have Mother's Day after that, and then we've got a couple more weeks. We're going to wrap up our series on faith. And the last week, I want to talk about um, how we handle disappointments in faith. Because how many of you know that when we start talking about faith and we start believing for things, uh, faith is not an automatic guarantee that you'll get an outcome. Is that right? Yep, I, I, I believe that anyway. Just because we have faith, it's not an automatic uh, 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 guarantee that I'm going to get whatever it is that I'm believing God for. Faith is a powerful thing, and we've been talking about that, the necessity of faith. Um, but there are times in life, too, where we believe for things and they don't happen, they don't come to pass, and there can be disappointments in our faith journey. So I want to sort of tie it all up in, in a few weeks' time by talking about how we manage those disappointments uh, when it comes to faith. But we're a few weeks away from that. Today, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about uh, contact points. Now, while you're sitting there thinking about what does he mean by contact points and what does that mean with faith, let me share a little story with you. When I was a kid, we used to have a porcelain kettle. Anyone ever have a porcelain kettle? Remember the porcelain kettles? Um, nowadays, you've got the, you know, the jug and you, you put it in. They're made of glass and all kinds of wonderful materials now. And you flick a switch and the water boils for your coffee. Well, we used to have a porcelain jug, and it was just a, a big porcelain thing with an element. Remember the element? It had an element that was in, and you would plug it into the wall, and the element would heat up. And as the element inside heated up, of course, the water would, would heat up. Well, one particular day, our porcelain jug had a broken lid. The lid was broken off it, but it didn't really matter. You just So anyway, one day I picked up the porcelain jug, and here's what I did. I put my hand inside the jug. And I didn't realise that I had my hands on the element uh, inside the jug and my thumb on the outside. And I picked up the jug, I walked over to the tap and I filled it with water. I walked back, I placed the jug on the bench and then I took the cord and I plugged it into the side of the jug and then I plugged it into the wall while I still had my hand on And then I flicked on the switch. Now I've never forgotten that moment. I, 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 I literally came alive. In that moment, in many, many regards. Came very close to death, but felt extremely alive for a brief second as the, the, the power and the electricity of that pulsated through my veins. Um, I'm, when I talk about contact points, that's what I'm talking about. Those, th those, those moments or those things that connect us to a power that is greater than ourselves. Power that is greater than ourselves. Now... What I did is I jumped onto Google and I typed in contact points because I just wanted to see, generally speaking, what, is, what do people see or think of when they think of the word contact point? And what I found really fascinating was the first reference that came up to contact points was actually a military reference. And, and here's what it said. It said, in land warfare, the point of contact is a point on the terrain, easily identifiable, where two or more units are required to make contact. So it's that point where Army A and Army B come into contact with each other and a battle begins, a battle take, pl takes place. And I thought, you know what? What a great uh, image of a point of contact in regards to our faith. How many of you know that there is a battle going on for faith? And when I say faith, I'm going to be very specific. There's a battle going on surrounding the Christian faith. There's a battle going on that we're living in that's surrounding the Christian faith. Faith is a battleground 
right now in many respects because of the culture we live in, the times that we're in and the things that we're facing. And not only that too, I think also potentially because of the state of where uh, maybe the church is at at the moment too and maybe the weariness that we're feeling from this battle that we have been engaged in, whether we feel like we've been actively engaged or whether we feel like we've been consciously engaged. If you're a follower of Jesus, we've all been engaged in that warfare uh, for some time. We're fighting to maintain faith in God in the midst of a changing culture. So we've got a culture that is, 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 has given up on saying there is no God. Culture gave up on that a number of years ago because there's just simply too much evidence for the existence of God. And the more that science makes discoveries in archaeology and biology, the more discoveries they make, the more they're coming to this idea that there had to be a creative designer behind this whole show that we're a part of because it's just too intricately made and there's too much wisdom and design. The human eye, the human eye has so much complexity in it that the greatest camera ever created still cannot come anywhere near the complexity of the human eye. Think about that. With all the brilliant uh, scientists and technology we have, we cannot create anything that comes anywhere near the intricacy and the power of the human eye when it comes to anything else that captures images and pictures. That's, that's amazing. And yet God created that by saying, let there be, and grabbing some mud and going, hey. So because God, God's an intelligent designer, he knows things. And he created a great world, and we might have messed it up a little bit, but it's still a great space to live in. Amen? It's still a good place. But we're fighting to maintain faith in God in the midst of ever-changing culture, a culture that no longer says God's not there. Now what they do is they say, okay, God is there, but we're going to tell you who God is. We're going to redefine who God is so that God begins to fit into the culture and so that God begins to go the way of culture because Culture's not going to stop. And so if we were to suddenly go, hang on, God is God and he's ever-changing and so on, then we need to accept the fact that certain parts of culture are heading in the wrong direction and we can't run down those pathways. But we don't want to do that, so what we do is we'll just redefine God. We'll reshape his word. We'll take this out, that out. We'll, we'll change definitions that have stood for 2,000 years of church history. 2,000 years of church theology, the study of God, the study of ancient languages will change things because we just want to stay in step with culture. So there's a real battle for faith in the culture in which we live. Or for some of us, maybe we've been fighting to maintain faith in God for a particular outcome that you believe he's spoken to you about. Maybe God said something to you about your children coming back to faith and you're, you're, you're fighting hard to maintain that sense of faith to believe for that. Or maybe the Lord's spoken to you about your destiny and your future, but, but you're not seeing it, and so you're fighting. Your, your faith battle is, well, God, you said this, it's not happening. Maybe it's a physical thing. That, that the Lord's spoken to you and said, I'm going to heal you, but it's not happening now. And so you're battling, trying to hold on to faith in that area of life. It could be any number of areas, but there's a battle going on for faith. There's a battle going on for faith. So from a Christian perspective and from the perspective of what I'm talking about today, a contact point is the place, the place where you are able to release the faith that you have. Just as in a battle, two enemy armies come together and that contact point, then they begin to release the fight within them. They begin to release everything that got them to that point where we're going up against you because we believe we can beat you and when we get in there, bang, something happens. There's a release of energy, there's a release of belief, there's a a, a release of all kinds of things, but something happens in that space. And so when we talk about contact points, we're talking about a place where there's a release for us of this thing called faith where we suddenly begin to maybe believe God again or where the belief we had is revived and refreshed and breathed back into us where we begin to to stand again on the promises of God, where we begin to think about God being bigger than the problem where previously the problem was thought of as way bigger than God. That's what we're talking about when we talk about contact points. Now, we know this. We know that faith is an environment where God finds the most freedom in which to do whatever it is that he wants. Amen? When we read uh, the, 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 the writings of Matthew, of Mark, of Luke, and of John, the four guys that were writing eyewitness or first-hand eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus Christ when he walked the earth, whether I like it or not, and if I'm brutally honest with you, I don't like it, but I can't escape the fact that when, when Jesus came into environments with faith, 
He was free to do a lot of things that he wanted to do. Unfortunately, I also see, and it's recorded, Matthew records it in his uh, writing, the book of uh, of Mark, sorry, in chapter 6. And he says, Jesus came to a place, Nazareth, where there was no faith. And it says he couldn't do any mighty miracles there, except heal a few headaches and ingrown toenails, which was way, way beneath the stuff that he came to do and that he had been doing and that he went on to do in other places. And why? He says, well, he couldn't do it because there was no faith there. So there's something about an environment of faith that frees God up to do what God wants to do. And as a follower of Jesus, that's what I want. I want to create space and and be in environments where God can do what he wants to do. Not where I become God and try to tell him what he should be doing. That's not faith. But be creating spaces where God is able to do what God wants to do. Because what's very clear there is that Jesus actually came to that town to do some things. But Jesus himself, think of it this way, the presence of God was there. The very presence of God was there, but it was limited as to what Jesus could do, even though the presence of God was there. But then you you fast forward, there's another uh, uh, story there um, where in in Matthew chapter 8, where I think a centurion comes to Jesus and says, I've got a servant at home who's sick. And Jesus says, well, I'll come pray for him. And And the servant says, you don't need to come to my house. He says, just say the word and he'll be healed. So here we are in a situation where the guy's going, I don't, need even, I don't need your presence to come there physically. You just say it, and I know it's going to happen. And so Jesus turns around and goes, man, I haven't seen such great faith. This is, this is amazing faith. So there's something about faith that's unavoidable if we want to live the life God wants for us, and if we want to experience everything that God has for us. Who wants to experience in their life everything that God has for them this side of heaven? Like David said, I, I, I'd lose hope. If I didn't think I'd see the goodness of God here now before I die. And that's what I want. I want to see the goodness of God now. I want to see everything God has for me now. I want to experience the things he wants me to experience. I want to have what he wants me to have. I want to be able to do what he wants me to do. And if that's what I want, then I need to take seriously the question of faith. Do I have faith? We've talked about this, and if if you're you're new here, we've been on this journey for about eight weeks. You can go on the YouTube channel. We've talked about how everybody has faith. We all have faith. Christians, non-Christians, everybody has faith. The question is, where is that faith directed? Where do you put your faith? And so on. But everybody has faith. Now, the devil has a plan for your life. And, and if you're not a believer here, you're probably thinking now he's really talking. It was Casper the Friendly Ghost before. Now he's really off his rocker. But bear with me. As, as a Christian, as a believer, we believe that there is God and God is good and he loves us. But we also believe in the devil. And the devil is not what you've seen in the cartoons, the, you know, the pitchfork tail. And the, now it actually says that the, the devil masquerades as an angel of light. He looks really good. That's why he's able to deceive people. Uh, he whispers things that sound really attractive. He offers you things that that your own flesh and heart really, really want, even if it's not the best for you. But he's been around for a long time doing what he's doing. And as much as God has a plan for our life, the devil also has a plan for our life. If you don't believe me, go back to Genesis. He had a plan for Adam and Eve, just as God did. God's plan was awesome. Stick by me and we're going to have an awesome time here. The devil said, my plan is to pull them away from God, get a foothold in this whole scheme, in this whole plan. And he did a pretty good job of it. And we've been paying the price ever since. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says this. Peter writes this. He says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That tells me that because he's looking for someone, he can't devour everyone. He's looking. There's something that he's looking for. You know. And then he says this. He says, Resist him. Resist the devil, standing firm in the faith. There's a connection between faith even and our ability to resist the enemy. There's a connection there between faith and our capacity to resist the devil in our world. Um, Two plans that the enemy has for your life. The first one is to stop you coming to faith. Now, for many of us, he failed at that plan. Praise God. He had that plan for my life and he failed. I came to faith 19 years of age. So that plan went out the window. He can't stop me coming to faith. And now that I know God is real, you you could try to tell me that God's not real. It's like trying to say to me, the sun won't come up tomorrow. You can have the greatest argument in the world, but my own life experience tells me, even if I don't want to believe it, and there are days where I don't want to believe that God's real, I'd just love to go off and do my own thing. But I can't escape the reality, just like I know the sun's going to come up tomorrow, I just know God's there. I just know that God is real. 
So he wants to stop you coming to faith. His second plan is this. If he can't stop you coming to faith, he will make you very apathetic about your faith. Okay, I'm in. I've got my fire insurance ticket, but that's all I want. That's it. When I die, I'll go to heaven, but I'm just going to get on with life. I don't expect to experience God in the land of the living, as David said. I'm happy not to experience God. Uh, uh, I'm just going to deal with life within my own power. My own, I'm going to use my own willpower to change me. I'm just going to, if I can't make it happen, it doesn't happen. Or With no expectation that there's a loving Father God out there who wants to get involved in your world who actually has compassion and care for you and loves you and, and has great things in store for you if you're completely surrendered to him. And listen to him. He wants to speak to you. He wants to lead you, you down good paths, you know. He wants to take you to good places. He, he's got good things in store for you. If he can't keep you from coming to faith, then he'll make you apathetic about your faith. So firstly, faith is not directed towards outcomes. Let's make that very, very clear as we go on and look at these contact points. Our faith is directed towards God. It's always directed towards God. I want you to think about that as we go through this, this uh, little list I'm about to give you. Uh, and secondly, as we direct our faith towards God on a daily basis, we start seeing our world through a different set of lenses. Okay? I look at life different now that I'm a Christian than I did before. Before I came to Christ, I looked at life this way. Um, was this going to make me a better football player? Was this going to get me a contract as a rock singer? Was this going to make me more money? Was this going to make me more popular? Was this going to get me another girl? Was this going to... That, that's how I looked at life. Bottom line, it was all me. What's, this, what, what, what's, what's in it for me? How's, what, what's the outcome going to be like on my life? That's all I cared about before I came to faith. But then God gets involved. And there's something about knowing that God is real that then changes your expectation from that point on. Man, anyone else experienced that? The expectation of life going forward now, if God is real and I believe he is, then my expectation is now different for what my life is going to look like going forward. Why? Because I walked without God, devoid of God and selfishly for nine, eight years. Now I'm starting to walk with God and for God uh, and the purposes and the plans of God. So, of course, I'm expecting things are going to be different with my life now. I'm looking at it through a different lens. Instead of just seeing what's in front of me, I start seeing the possibility of what could be because of the reality of God. Amen? Think about that. Instead of just looking at what's in front of you now, what's in front of you right now? Now what I want you to do is I want you to think about that thing that's in front of you right now. Now I want you to remind yourself, but because God's real, what possible difference could be made to that situation or that thing? How could that circumstance look different going forward because God is real? Because there's a real God that loves you. Now, if I want things to stay the same, exactly keep what's in front of me, then all I've got to keep doing is doing the same thing and being the same person. But I don't want it to stay the same. If I want the possibility of what could happen because of God's reality, then I want to create an environment of faith around me. Amen? I want to be in spaces and places where I can connect my faith to the reality of God and let's see what happens. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about contact points. We see this principle actually in the Bible itself and we see it in the lives of many, many people. Let me give you a few examples of some contact points in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 8, we've got the story of this Roman centurion, right? And the centurion comes to Jesus and says, uh, in verse 6, he says, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed and suffering terribly. What's he saying? He's saying, this is what's in front of me right now. I've got a servant at home and my servant is paralyzed, sick, Things aren't going good for my servant. That's what's in front of me right now. This is the reality that he's faced with. But because of the existence of Jesus, he sees the potential for another reality. In verse 9, he says this. He says that Jesus, just say the word, and my servant can be healed. What's he saying? Here's the reality right now. My servant's at home paralyzed and sick. But because of the reality of Jesus, if you would just say a word, then that reality could change. I could have a different reality up ahead of me because Jesus is real. Now, if Jesus ain't there, we don't have this story. But everything I'm about to tell you, it's because somebody knew that God was there. And because of God and the reality of God, that meant that what was in front of them could have become something different. It could change and it could transform. He says, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Now, what's the contact point there? The contact point for that centurion was, Jesus, just say it. In other words, if Jesus says it, Faith is released and I can believe for things to happen. And, and there might be people in this room here and that's your contact point. 
You, you, you go, you know what, if, if, if Jesus said something, if he came and audibly said, then yes, I, I could believe. You know, I know it sounds like a no-brainer and we all think that would happen, but I actually know of people who have had literal visions of Jesus. I know uh, a mate of mine has a friend who was in a truck accident. He was walking with the Lord, following Jesus, turned his back on God, went his own way, driving a truck, had a truck accident, truck flipped upside down. He's in the truck, in the cabin. The cabin burst into flames. He screams out. He said, I saw Jesus Christ. He walked towards the door of the truck, he opened up the truck, unbuckled me, and dragged him out of the cabin of his truck. This is this guy saying it. Dragged him out of the cabin of his truck. The guy went to hospital, got healed, but guess what happened a few months after that when he got up and running again? He turned away from God and didn't care about God. So when I say, if you heard a voice, everyone goes, yeah, of course we could. You know what? Probably not everybody would. That's just the reality. But for some people, that kind of thing would be a real contact point. If I heard it, man, my faith would just be released. And and when that faith is released, all of a sudden I'm in an environment where where there's more chance of God doing what he wants to do than he could have done before that contact point happened. In Matthew chapter 9, we've got a a ruler who has a daughter and his daughter has died. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. It says, while he was saying this, a synagogue leader, this is Jesus, while Jesus was talking, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died. What's he saying? Here's what's in front of me right now. I've got a daughter and my daughter has just died. That's the reality that he's living in right now. That's what he's faced with. That's what's in front of him. This is the reality in front of him, but because of the existence of Jesus, he also sees potential for a different reality to manifest. He says, but come and put your hand on her and she'll live. Come and put your hand on her and she'll live. What was he saying? He was saying, if you put your hand on her, then that's my contact point. My contact point is, Jesus, if you would physically put your hand on her, faith would be released in my life and I could create an environment in my world where you would have more opportunity to do whatever it is that God wants to do. If Jesus would just put his hand, this other guy said, you don't even need to touch me. You just say the word. That was his contact point. Say the word and faith can be released and I can believe God for something to change what's in front of me. This guy says, now come and lay hands. That's the contact point. You lay hands and then I'll be able to believe that you can change what's in front of me. Mark chapter five, we've got a third one. And this is the woman with the issue of blood, that constant flow of blood. We all know the story. Jesus is on his way somewhere else. And this woman bustles away through the crowd and reaches out to touch Jesus. We all, those who have been around church for a while know the story. Mark chapter 5, verse 25 to 26. It says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 12 years of constant, constant bleeding. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. What was in front of her? What was she looking at? All of this money spent and this time with doctors and so on, and whatever it was, a problem she had, a hemorrhage that could not be cured. That's the reality of what was in front of her at the time. That's what she saw. This was the reality in front of her, but because of the existence of Jesus, she saw the potential for an alternative reality other than what was actually in front of her. Verse 27 and 28 say this, when, when, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. What was her contact point? You don't need to say, Jesus. You don't need to touch me. If I touch you, that's that contact point I'm looking for where I believe faith can be released in my life and I can believe God for something that he wants to do in my world. So we all have contact points. Those, those places we get ourselves in, where faith rises inside of us, even if it's just for a moment. But we know it's like putting a hand on that kettle. It didn't last long, but boy, it was real. I just got a buzz and a twitch and everything happened. At one moment, the world was new. Colours were everywhere. It's like that in those moments where we have that, we have that contact point. What is that contact point for you? where you can look at what's in front of you, but you know in this kind of environment or this setting or this place or this thing, that that's when faith can infuse me and I can actually believe for an alternate reality other than the actual reality that's right there in front of me. Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, here's another weird one. This is, this, now we're getting a bit weird, but still, they're contact points. Acts chapter 5, verse 15. People brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. What's the reality in front of him? We got all these sick people in the community. That's the reality. All these sick people paralyzed. These guys not doing well. That's the reality. 
And so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to lay them out on the footpath. Why? Because we think if Peter's shadow comes past and touched... By the way, anyone ever healed anyone with their shadow? Didn't think so. Um, so if Peter's shadow came by, that at least the shadow touched them, then maybe that would be the contact point and maybe we could see something happen and they could get up. The reality was there's all these sick people, but again, because of the reality of Jesus... There's the potential for a different type of reality. But they're looking for a contact point. What's the contact point that constantly reminds me that Jesus is alive, Jesus is here, and the, and the future can be different to the past? What's that contact point for you? Verse 16 says, Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed by a shadow. Passing by from Peter, they were healed. What was the contact point? In this situation, it's a shadow. We've seen Jesus speaking. That was a contact point for someone. Jesus laying his hands was a contact point for another one. That person laying their hands on Jesus was another contact point for a different person. Laying in, in, in a passing shadow of Peter was a contact point for these people. It gets even crazier later on in Acts 19, verse 11 and 12. It says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, the apostle, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. What's the contact point? It was, it was hankies and aprons. I don't know whether he was barbecuing and then auctioned off his apron and somebody took the apron. Or, and I hope the hankies were washed. I really do. But it just didn't matter whether they were washed or not. It was a contact point. These people believed if we could just get a hold of one of those things, then faith could be released in us. And when there's an environment of faith, God can do the things that he wants to do in an environment of faith. Contact points. They're all throughout the word of God, where people had different contact points. In the Old Testament, remember when, when Israel sinned and the serpents, the snakes came and bit everybody and people were getting, dying of snakes and, and then God says, you know, build this bronze serpent. Remember that story? And anyone who looks upon the serpent will be healed. It's a, what was this bronze serpent? It was a contact point. Look there and, 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 and God says, if you look there, you'll be healed. Well, they look there and faith happens. Something happens on the inside of us where we get this infusion of faith to believe God for a different outcome than maybe what's right in front of us now. Faith, whether we like it or not, faith is a really, really important thing in the New Testament church. I wonder sometimes whether, as time's gone on, whether we've lowered our expectation of faith, whether we've adopted a bit of a sort of a Doris Day faith, you know? Okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. If you want to do it, God, you go ahead, but you don't need me. Okay, sirrah, sirrah. And yet I can't escape the fact that when Jesus found faith, it created a space where he had the capacity to do more of what he wanted to do. And in environments with less faith, he was somewhat hindered, which almost sounds blasphemous to me, that God could be hindered. But yet that's what I read. And I don't think God is hindered because he couldn't override no faith. He can do that if he wants to. But he wants us to participate in this journey by building our faith, by being in places where we get to know God more. See, faith is built by getting to know your Father. Me and the more I know how much God loves me, how much God is for me, the more I understand him, the more intimate I get with him, the more I walk with him, the more I get into his word, the more faith builds inside of me. And I actually start to believe that, hey, maybe some of these things that I'm struggling with now, God, maybe you could set me free from those. Maybe some of these issues I'm battling, God, maybe you've got answers and solutions. Well, maybe some of those desires in my heart uh, uh, that, that you've placed there, maybe you actually want to take that a step further and begin to see some of them things actually manifest in my world and, and I can have a, a future that's, that's what you see, what you envision, what you want for me and not just be so limited by what I feel like I deserve or I feel like I'm good enough to have or I feel like I'm smart enough or clever or whatever, you know. Even a hanky can create an environment of faith in a person's life. Now, here's the thing. It wasn't Jesus' word, it wasn't his hand, it wasn't the woman's hand, it wasn't Peter's shadow, it wasn't Paul's hanky, it wasn't the pool, the water in the pool of Bethesda, it wasn't a serpent, bronze serpent, it wasn't the Jordan River, remember Naaman was told go wash in the Jordan, it wasn't the waters of the Jordan River or anything like that that had the inherent power to bring to pass that alternative reality. It was God. It was God. But God knows how we're made. And so God knows that there are contact points, there are certain things along the journey that if we get in those spaces, they tend to create faith in us and a capacity to believe God for more 
of what he wants and escape maybe more of what we think we want. It's probably not the best thing for us anyway. Let me ask you a question. What are some of your contact points today? What are some of your contact points? I can tell you now straight away, three contact points for me, they're no-brainers. Number one is coming along to church and gathering with other believers. Every time I have a conversation with another believer in Jesus, I find faith begins to build in my heart and I start to be reminded constantly of the goodness of God, the reality of God, the presence of God. And that the God that I serve has answer solutions and can do things way exceedingly abundantly above all I could ever possibly ask or think and I can think some crazy stuff. But yet he can go way, way beyond that if he chooses to, if he wants to. But I want to get to know him so that I know what he wants, so I know what I should be believing and, and, and what I can be expecting and so on. Not everything's guaranteed. Faith is not guaranteeing you any outcomes. But what it does is it creates space where God can do what it is that God wants. The Word of God is a great one for me. Every time I open the pages of that book and I read what those ancient writers wrote and and they're telling me about who God is and who I am and how he sees me and how I interact, every time I pick that up, I find little seeds of faith begin to bubble inside me. And I go, yeah, that's right. That's right. We're we're not of this world. You know, That's right. I'm I'm blessed already with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I've got the mind of Christ. I'm the head. I I, I start to read all these things and I start to see these things. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. And faith begins to rise inside of my heart. And worship. I love coming into worship. I stand here and when you start raising your hands, you start singing what a beautiful name it is. You start thinking about Jesus. You start singing that. And all of a sudden, my attention that's been all over the shop, you know, over here celebrating the Tigers' wonderful victory over the bunnies last night. Any bunny supporters here? Okay. Uh, cheering on that. And then I've got this going on over here and I've got these issues and I've got maybe a holiday, all this stuff. But then I start worshipping and oof, everything just got to, gets brought into focus and I'm focused on God. And in that environment, again, I find faith begins to rise in my heart. But here's the thing, we're all different and there's no one contact point for everybody. Contact points are different for people. Um, I, I, I've got my car out there and um, it's the newest model car I've ever had. I've had it for a few years now. But when I bought it, I, I asked that my uncle who sold it to me, where's the key? And he gave me this black thing with buttons on it. It didn't have like a thing, like a key thing. And he said, no, you don't need it. You just get in the car and you push a button. You make sure, it's like an electric start. Anyone got an electric start? You just got to have the key thing. So I do that. But then every now and then I might jump in Jackie's car to go for a drive. And I jump in Jackie's car and I'm poking at the dash but nothing happens. You see, because she's actually got a key that goes into the thing and you turn the thing there. And so the contact point in my car is, is to get to fire that engine up, the contact point is a button. I just got to push that button. But if I get in Jackie's car, the contact point to fire that up is different. I've got to put a key in and turn a key in and so on. And so contact points are different. And no, contact points are not a, a mark of maturity. And, and sometimes we feel that way, don't we? Sometimes we, have you ever done this? And if you have, then I hope that you don't ever do it again. Somebody comes forward for prayer one week and they get prayed for. And the next week, that same person comes forward for prayer again. And the next week, they come forward for prayer again and again. And after a while, people start going, oh, it's just them again. What do they keep? Have you ever wondered, maybe that's a contact point for faith for them. When they come forward for prayer, even though they do it every week, but maybe that's their contact point. If somebody would pray, some people go, if a leader prays for me. Now, anyone can pray for anyone, can't they? And we encourage that in this gathering here, at the end of our service, grab the person next to you, pray with them. We don't have to pray for you. There's nothing more special about leaders or pastors. We've all got the Spirit of God if we surrender our life to Him. But here's the thing. For some people, they go, yeah, but I really want the pastor to pray for me. And you'll see people in churches where they go, no, no, I want the pastor to pray. Even, even the other leaders, no, no, I want the pastor. Why? Well, well, if that's a point of contact for them to release their faith, then who am I to judge them? Why would I judge them for that? Why would I say, no, no, and I push them, no, no, you've got to go and get prayer over there. Well, they could get prayer and go through the motion somewhere else. But if it's not releasing faith, if it's not their contact point, some people don't care. Some people pray for anyone. But what's your contact point? What's that point in your world where faith begins to rise up inside of you? To believe God. Maybe you've got to get into the Word of God and you, you study out whatever your situation is and you find all the verses. And that. There's no set contact point, but what I do see in the Word of God is this, that there are contact points that tend to build and release faith in our world. And when faith is released, we create environments or spaces around us where God can come on in and God can do whatever it is that God wants to do. Don't ever feel embarrassed if your contact point is different to somebody else's. Just find what your contact point is so that we're consistently getting in environments and spaces where we're continuously building our faith and our trust in God. Because if God is real, then what's in front of me could have an alternative reality. But I'm never really going to experience that alternative reality unless A, God overrides everything and just 
does it for me anyway, which is probably not what we see mostly in the Word of God. Or I've got to get in spaces of faith so I can begin to connect with God, create an environment around my world where God has the freedom to come on in and do what he wants to do. All of these contact points, there's a common denominator for everyone you read in the Word of God, and it's this. They needed to put themselves in a position to make contact with those points. They had to do something, didn't they? The centurion had to come to Jesus and say, say the word. The, 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 the woman with the issue of blood had to fight through the crowd and reach out and touch Jesus. The sick people had to be carried out and put on the sidewalk for the shadow to go past. People had to collect the aprons or whatever. There's always a part that we play. And, and, and what I want you to think about is what is your contact point? What, what, what are the environments or spaces where for you, you know that those things kind of generate and bubble up faith inside of me. What are your contact points? What are the environments to help release faith in your life? And then secondly, how actively do you keep connected to those points? How actively do you keep connected to those points? So that faith is something like a gentle rain that just keeps on falling on us all the time, not where we go through these bursts. Anyone go through bursts in their faith life where they really press into God and they, they come to church and when they've got a trial and everything's bad and people are praying for them and they're talking to them. But then when, when, when life is really, really good, that they kind of uh, don't need that anymore, I'm going okay now. And then we kind of back away from our prayer lives and our devotional worlds and, 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 and all that stuff. But then we get into another crisis and we, and we wonder why our faith goes like this. I think God wants our faith to go like that. The more we get to know him, the more we know we can trust him. The more we trust him, the more faith is generated, the more faith, the more environment of faith that we create in our world, then we get to that place where we, we, we can handle anything because when we've got that space around us, we know that whatever's happening, I can handle it with Jesus. Whether the storm gets calmed or whether I've got to curl up with Jesus at the front of the boat and sleep through the wildest storm imaginable, but I know I can do it. I know I can do it because I've built faith and trust into my world. Hey, I want to do something. Uh, I'll get the guys to come back. We're going to finish up. I want to sing that song with a beautiful name again. And we're going to finish up. Um, I'm going to, we're going to open up the front again uh, this morning. Just prayer. We just want to pray for people. If there's stuff going on in your world, we'd love to pray with you. Um, if you're sitting there, uh, you might want to turn to the person next to you and ask them right now, hey, can I pray for you for anything? It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be up the front with, with us. Uh, you, you could be praying for one another. Can I encourage you, if you feel like the Holy Spirit said something to you, go and talk to someone about it. Don't just get up, walk away, and have your roast chicken for lunch, and, and next week you'll turn up, and, and, and we don't even remember what was said last week because we go through this 52 times a year, and it kind of goes in, and we go, oh, wasn't that great? And then two hours later, we've lost it all because we didn't engage with whatever it is that God's speaking to us. So can I encourage you to pray with one another, come up if you want prayer, talk to one another, grab a tea and coffee. We're going to just finish with a song of worship. You don't have to stay. You can grab your coffee or whatever you need to. Um, But uh, just just make sure that you stay engaged and connected with God and that you continue to build those faith spaces. Work out for you individually. What is your contact point? And make sure as much as you can, get into that space, that contact place for you so you can build a strong, lasting faith. So Father, we thank you. For this morning, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, uh, God, the opportunity to gather. Lord, I pray for each person here, God, as we walk away from here, God, we would look at our life and we would go, what are those moments, what are those times, those places, those things, that when I'm engaged there, faith rises in my heart. When I'm engaged in that, when I'm in those places, those spaces, I feel more alive to you, God, more connected to you, Father. Lord, make us aware of those places that help build faith because Lord we want to create environments of faith Lord not not so that we can go aren't we wonderful now we got faith and we'll tell you what to do it doesn't work like that but Lord so that we can create space and know with confidence that you're free to do whatever it is that you want to do Father so Lord we ask this in Jesus name everybody said Amen. Amen Amen